10 of the most disgusting picks too many of you are making right now in fantasy football drafts from the mind of Hayden Winks. Yes, I'm to be a hater. I've done like 50 plus drafts. So I have like a very good understanding of the buckets of players I want to draft from. Like, for example, late round tight end doesn't feel as good to me. Late round quarterback seems better than usual. And then we'll get to the running backs and wide receivers. But usually we save a show like this for August. Yes, there's just there's too many drafts happening on underdog to wait for that. Right now we have twenty two million dollars available on underdog. That's too much money at stake. Too many drafts going on right now. So I wanted to express some of my hatred uh, early on. Yeah, I was going to mention this, that every August we post the audience's, one of their favorite videos, the worst pick in every round of Facey football. I'll do an entire show. You do an entire show. Mm -hmm. But last week, I got a message that Hayden was so pissed off when looking at some ADPs and where oh, players yeah. was going in drafts that he actually, I think, put 30 names together. And that yes. link is in the description down yeah. below. Yeah. We're only going to hit on 10 of them today. Some of them are being drafted in the top 50, some of the mid rounds some of the late rounds. We've actually talked about a number of these and maybe took the positive outcomes or just the conversations of, you know, which directions their seasons could mm -hmm. go. Why don't you kick us off though, Hayden? Uh, we'll go in ADP order. Who's at the top of your list here? Sam Laporte is now going in the third round of drafts and he even goes higher than that in weekly winners. I'm just not sure if I actually want to rank him as a tight end one overall. Like the more I think about it, Travis Kelsey, if you actually include the NFL playoffs, average more fantasy points. Then Sam Laporta, Travis Kelsey is also Travis Kelsey. We've seen this thing before. The Chiefs are projected for way more points this year. So that's going to be something I'm going to be mentioning that we have uh, the betting markets. We have, we have now projected team totals for every single game. And the Chiefs are going to be fantastic this year after last year. They were middle of the road. And Sam Laporta last year finished 47th overall in fantasy points over replacement per game, which is my favorite metric to kind of compare uh, scoring across positions. He scored 10 touchdowns last year. Like maybe he can do that again. Like he's going to be a very good player, but if I can get Mark Andrews or Travis Kelsey after Sam Laporta, I'd rather do that. And to me, there seems to be more of a drop off in round three. Like there's some round three guys that we talked about in our wide receiver show that I want to draft like the Jalen Waddle types, uh, DK Metcalf, Derek Henry, those type of guys. R round four is kind of more of the disgusting range. And I would rather draft my tight ends in that range. Uh, and I think there's more of an opportunity cost in round three. So Sam Laporta, a hell of a player. I just think that he goes around too early. Sam Laporta, we talked about him in our second year tight end breakouts. Obviously, he was the rookie last year that broke out. We've talked about it a lot at the position. That it's this young, new wave of athletic pass catchers versus all the names that you mentioned that we were drafting so highly for years, the Kelsey's, the Andrews, the Kittles, the Wallers, who had now has now eventually retired. They are now either declining or gone. And mm -hmm. so I do wonder if this early draft capital, again, tied in one, 32 overall, is for the next wave to try to be on the cusp of that because it is quite different of drafting Travis Kelsey with the seventh overall selection than it is the 32 overall selection. I will say there's a pretty big difference in the last season of what we just got with Sam Laporta and then drafting him as the top name because he had 11 and a half points per game this past season. Travis Kelsey in 2022 was 15.4. In 2021, that was 13.6. In 2020, that was 17.4. You yeah. get the picture. So we weren't just paying for the tight end one at that time. We were paying for, you know, a three to five point cushion yep. at a onesie position nearly every single week. Yep. And to me, that is the massive difference between one guy, Sam Laporta being the tight end one versus the mm -hmm. years that we got of Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews being the overall tight end one. There was a clear canyon yep. between them and the next group. When Travis Kelsey was completely balling out, he had finished in the top 15 overall in that fantasy points over replacement per game. That's why Sam Laporta at 47th. Like that to me is the, the gap that we're talking about uh, between the peak Travis Kelsey and what we had with Sam Laporta. I think the final reason here, and I think it's something that we have to be extra mindful of on underdog in particular, is the week 17 matchups. Players will get kind of dragged up or dragged down based off of the matchup. Well, it's Lions versus 49ers. If you look where the 49ers guys are being drafted, Debo and Ayuk, it's at the round two, three turn. So you're going to see more and more drafters reach on Sam Laporta to pair those guys up for correlation re reasons, not for projection reasons. So if you're not drafting on underdog and this is for redraft, or if you're just looking for kind of one-off players in round three and not for week 17 correlation, I think the projection 
versus where the draft pick it's happening for reasons that are not based off of the on-field production it's for correlation purposes which i understand but for for me i want to focus on my correlation a little bit later on the draft not in round three and one final note you mentioned it he's going seven spots ahead of travis kelsey right now 18 spots ahead of mark andrews so it's not just oh i like sam laporta which by the way we do because you're drafting ben johnson and this offense to go along with a super athletic tight end who's used as really a wide receiver in in many cases but it's the balance it's the trade-off of taking him at his spot versus a round or two or three later yep. or five or six later at another onesie position because mm -hmm. we talked about dk metcalf and how i made the case of how he can have you know a top 10 overall wide receiver season this year he's being selected one spot earlier than sam laporta derrick henry's going as running back 9 33 overall we could easily see a top five season at running yep. back from derrick henry that is an easy case to make and so it's the trade-off here and you can't necessarily say that with many names going mm -hmm. with where Mark Andrews is going around and a half. Yep. Later on. Final prediction. I think Travis Kelsey will end up being the tight end one over Sam Laporta by the time the last best ball mania draft happens. I, I think that Kelsey is going to continue to climb up and I think eventually we'll be back to where this whole thing started where Kelsey is the guy. Going okay. One around. name down is the uh, hate meter still really high. Should we keep uh, going or do you just want yeah. to end the video here? No, we're, this is not going to go well in the comments. All right. I'm already well, well prepared for this one. Zay flowers. I mean, this guy, everyone loves this dude. I understand it. He's very flashy out there. Uh, I just want to bring up a couple uh, notes here from week two to week 10. That's when Mark Andrews was on the field. Mark Andrews averaged 12.2 half PPR points on 10 points expected based off his usage. Zay flowers over that same nine game stretch was at 8.2 on 8.6 expected points. 8.2 half PPR points is not a third, fourth round pick. Now, he went completely nuclear once Mark Andrews left. Is that because Zay Flowers post by rookie bump starts balling out? Part Partly, yes. But also, he's competing with Nelson Aguilar and Rashad Bateman with nobody else in the offense. Keep in mind, this was also a year where Lamar Jackson won the MVP and before they added Derrick Henry, and then you brought up the offensive line before the show, the Ravens offensive line does not look as good as it once was. If you look at the projected points this season, the Ravens are projected actually for 2.5 fewer points per game this year than they were last year. And now we have all of this competition in the offense. Zay Flowers individually, I thought was a good player, not a great player. I, I expect him obviously to look better in year two, but like one number out there, wide receiver 52, uh, and man coverage composite score out there. I think that he's going to do better. There are some missed opportunities down the field, but if it's Zay Flowers or Lamar Jackson in round four, I just want Lamar Jackson. Is that crazy here? Like Lamar Jackson has done this year after year after year, and I can stack him with Mark Andrews in round five fairly easily. And if Zay Flowers is going to end up being worth this round four draft pick, I mean, what is Lamar Jackson going to look like in fantasy? If Mark Andrews, Zay Flowers also hit in round four, round five. So uh, I know wide receivers go early. Zay Flowers is a good player. I'm just betting against him on being a great player uh, in this offense. In fact, he's going one spot before round four as like the 36th overall selection, 35th overall selection as wide receiver 25 at this time. I'm going to kind of give you two outcomes here or just points that can go in either direction. Let's yep. put it that way. Who do you think over what the five seasons that we've seen Lamar Jackson's a full time starter in the NFL? What's the highest finish among all wide receivers Ooh. for his top target in that span? It would have to be like, what Hollywood Brown, right? At yes. some point. And he was probably the wide receiver 18 during his MVP year. 2021 wide receiver 29 points Whoa. per game was Hollywood Brown. That was the highest finish that we've seen again for a Lamar Jackson wide receiver. Now you can take that in a couple ways too. It could be, well, it's Hollywood Brown at that time. He was winning most in one area of the field. I think you can easily make the case that maybe this version of Zay Flowers could be a better player than Hollywood Brown ever since then. Sure. You know, we haven't had anyone other than Mark Andrews at tight end in terms of wide receivers attached to Lamar Jackson. They haven't done mm -hmm. a great job. It was also Greg Roman and, yep. you know, not Todd Monken, so on and so forth. But it's on my radar a little bit that this is a player who likes to feed things around. And at the same yeah. time, in our second year wide receiver breakouts video, I just don't think that this is your traditional wide receiver one in an mm -hmm. NFL offense. He can operate that in the Ravens team and yep. in their structure of their, their group. But this is not the focal point of your passing game player that I think you build yeah. everything around. Now, on the other coin, how I think, other than what you said, the timing of 
when Zay Flowers broke out towards the back half of the season, what the final five, week eleven on, not, yeah. yeah, five final nine games without Mark Andrews versus the first nine games with him, mm-hmm. that coincides with you know the post by Ricky Bump as you pointed out. It's also just connecting on downfield shots. Yes. It's exactly what we talked about. I and mean, he caught 11 of 23, 20 plus yard targets. Mm-hmm. And despite Lamar Jackson winning MVP, they just were not on the same page on downfield routes. So I think that is untapped potential that is yep. not connected here yet. And maybe that does change in year two yep. with these two working together. I think all of what you said is I'm expecting Zay Flowers to be better because of regression on those deep passes. And also just he's going to be more familiar with the offense. And as a reminder, like, Todd Monken, this is his second year in this in the the scheme. Like we haven't that, that was last year when the he won the MVP in the first, first year of the system. Like there is this completely untapped potential, especially with second year players. Like there is a path to Zay Flowers being the wide receiver twelve on the season. I can just say that about a lot of other wide receivers being drafted right next to him, where I've actually kind of seen this a little bit before. And then uh, wide receiver fantasy usage last year, the Ravens were twenty fourth. So. If you add Derrick Henry, is that number going to go up or down? I'm not sure. An outcome of wide receiver 11 to wide receiver 20, I do believe is reasonable here for yeah. Safe Flowers. I just can't see an outcome where he's like a top 10 scoring wide receiver sure. points per game at the end of the year. Okay. Yep. Two down, eight to go. Who's name number three? Jaden Reed, very similar player to Zay Flowers in an offense that I like. I think that Jaden Reed and Zay Flowers are both good players. I'm not sure if they're true number one options. And for Jaden Reed, He's being drafted ahead of a lot of players that are going to be full-time options and downfield uh, uh, targets. Jaden Reed last year with Christian Watson, he had 6.4 half PPR points per game. That includes 4.7 points, 4.6 points in the two playoff games when Christian Watson returned. When Christian Watson was out of the lineup, that was up at 10.8 expected half PPR points. Now, Christian Watson, I think, is an up-and-down player. Hopefully, his hamstring injuries uh, are okay this year, but there's like four, maybe you can argue Bo Melton's a fifth guy that they're going to be rotating. There's two uh, tight ends that they want to get involved. This historically has been a somewhat balanced offense in general. I'm just worried about Jaden Reed, like getting enough targets yeah. going his way. And then the second thing is just natural regression. Like last year, uh, plus 30 percentage points above his projected totals. That's because on his deep targets, he was the wide receiver 16 in completion percentage over expected. And then he also scored, uh, he was the number 15 wide receiver in receiving touchdowns over expected. And then on top of that, he added two rushing touchdowns as a, a runner. So I think it's regression, but I think the bigger part is just like, I think playing time is going to be like a little bit of an issue here. Like we can't say Dontavian Wicks is good. Romeo right. Dobbs is like an innings eater. Uh, Christian Watson, we've seen the upside to him and Jaden Reed. They're like, is Jordan Love really going to win the MVP? I'm not sure about that. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, he could. <laughs> my, my point goes exactly into that because when it was nut cutting time, right? Everything was on the line in the playoffs. I just wanted to go look and it's a two game sample, but one of the few times that the offense was clicking, Jordan yep. Love was playing at a high level. Everyone was finally accomplishing their assignments and everyone was back healthy. Who was on the field? Because that is the big question that we have heading it's into dogs. 2024. <laughs> okay. In those two playoff games, Jaden Reed played 46% of the snaps, then 61% of the snaps. Dontavian Wicks was at 55 and 40%. Christian Watson was at 41% and 55. And then Romeo Dobbs was at 70% and 81%. Yeah. And if, if I think one guy has the lesser of all those traits special, in a uh, vacuum. Mm-hmm. I think Romeo Dobbs is that answer. Cause I don't know. We, we both watched Don Tavian Wicks for a second year breakouts wide receiver yeah. show. And I just came away with the conclusion of how can you take this guy off the field? But right. you can say the same thing with Jane Reed. We've seen splash plays, flashes, streaks of five or six games when Christian Watson makes moves and makes magic. Right. So I guess the point is I really like Jane Reed as wide receiver 34. I just think the massive gap that we're getting on this team that is obviously going to rotate wide receivers other than Mm -hmm. um, Romeo Dobbs, it seems, wide receiver 34 to wide receiver 60 in Dontavian Wicks is too big of a gap. And the player profiles that we're talking about, Jaden Reed, primarily a slot wide receiver. He's also a manufactured touch guy. So that is valuable. And like he earned those rushing touchdowns because he's very special laterally. And like LaFleur is awesome at designing stuff. So he could run hot on touchdowns again but he is a tinier slot wide receiver type and those numbers at christian watson the playing time numbers like 
that was just coming off an injury. Like if Christian Watson is healthy, this entire training camp, like they invested a lot of draft capital in Christian Watson. We've seen Christian Watson go on a hell of a run here. Like I wouldn't be surprised if Christian Watson is playing 80 ish percent of the percentage of the snaps. And if that's the case, it's going to be pretty tough to kind of sort out the rest of them. So you're just like, if you're looking at playing time versus the wide receivers that go next to Jaden Reed, it's not even close. Speaking of Christian Watson Thursday, the great, Matt Harmon is going to be on this show, and we're going to discuss third-year wide receiver standouts. I mean, it's a difficult group other than at the top. Then you have, you know, Christian Watson, Pickens, John Dotson, George Pickens, yeah. Jamison Williams, some other names. So be sure to tune into that episode here on Thursday. And in order to do that, click subscribe and the thumbs up down below so you're notified as soon as that video is on your feed. Okay. Name number four. Who is it? Alvin Kamara, 29 years old, and it's been three straight seasons where he's finished below average in fantasy efficiency. And last year, negative 11% versus ex his expectation. That was a career low. It was also a career low if you're not looking for the fancy boy numbers and yards per touch. And this one kind of surprised me because the Saints offense was already unwatchable last year. Yeah. If you look at the betting markets, the team total, they're projected for 1.4 fewer points per game this year than they were last year. That's not good. Like, how, how fired up were you to watch Saints games last year? They're supposed to be worse this year. Um, if you look at the offensive line, that's probably a primary reason why. The offensive line is losing players to injury and retirement left and right here. And I thought they were kind of underwhelmed last year on top of that. They, they still don't know if they're getting anything from Trevor Penning for example, plus let's say the Saints are mediocre this year and they're kind of out of the, the race in the NFC South and the wild card by week 16, week 17, when everything matters. Kendry Miller, to me, is a totally worthwhile investment for the Saints to kind of figure out if he can be the primary option moving for, forward. Alvin Kamara is not a lock to be on the roster next year. So I think that there's plenty of incentive to bring Kendry Miller on the field. And I think that can come at the goal line in particular. If Alvin Kamara has anything left in the tank, I think it's as a receiver and a dump off option. I think if you're going to spell him out of there, I think it could be Kendry Miller and perhaps Kendry Miller becomes a goal line back and there's just right. not enough touchdowns to go around the Saints offense. So I think Alvin Kamara is like one of the easiest fades for me. Even if the running back prices are discounted, I'll just take David Montgomery or somebody else around him. I don't really have an Alvin Kamara take. He's being drafted as running back 17, 71st overall right now. I do want to take a moment to talk about the change in play caller for the New Orleans Saints because I believe at times during summers we forget how much that matters. I don't know that much about Clint Kubiak other than he's Gary Kubiak's son, was also the Minnesota Vikings offensive coordinator back in 2021 for, I believe, one season after being quarterback's coach there. Uh, in that one season, in 13 games, Alvin Kamara got 250 carries, 1,100 rushing yards, six touchdowns. Also added, you know, 49 targets, 224 receiving yards. Uh, it was also, you know, a nice season for Alexander Madison with uh, three rushing touchdowns, 500 yards, another 40 targets for him too. So look, you and I, maybe top down level, aren't that into the Saints. I just want to not hammer that home in my brain mm -hmm. too much because it's Dennis Allen and nothing feels like it has changed. Right. They keep bringing the boys back. <laughs> but I, I am leaving a door open, just slightly ajar, let's say. Yep for maybe potentially Clint Kubiak just shocking us versus what the Pete Carmichael's of the world have done previously. I would say like there was a lot of really bad offensive coordinators last year. What the Saints were trotting out to me was among the very worst. And yeah. hopefully it's just more modern approaches to things. But like modern could mean younger and that would not be a good thing for Alvin Kamara. But that's, that was like because the offensive coaching staff has changed. That's what caught me off guard when I was like looking at the team totals and at the Saints projection for fewer points. I was yeah, like, yeah, I hear you. That's a low bar. They're not, right now looking at it 25th in projected points this season, right next to the Steelers and the Commanders. Yeah. Not good. I mean, when you have vanilla soft serve as your quarterback, uh, you know, yeah. the expectations are there. Okay. Let's close out the top five with one of those third year wide receivers. Hey. Khalil Shakir uh, out of Buffalo. Um, I'm sure the reason why he's being drafted where he is is because. The team that drafted Josh Allen in round three or round four are looking for someone to correlate with. I'm just not sure if Khalil Shakir is like the guy. He's never been a three wide receiver or a two wide receiver set player. He's been right. primarily a slot option. They bring in Curtis Samuel, uh, who's actually a good football player, like confirmed. Yes, 
Also, I looked at it. Curtis Samuel is 27 years old. I mean, this is a player like still in the prime of his career with familiarity with this offensive coordinator as well. So I think that Curtis Samuel is the guy to target, not Khalil Shakir. And if you're looking at Khalil Shakir against man coverage, out of 117 qualifiers last season, he was wide receiver 84 in that composite score. His targets per route were in the bottom eighth percentile there. So I'm not sure like, he, he had a couple like broken plays or yards after the catch plays. And I think that he's a c- capable at that. Is he like some standout guy that you have to get on the field? I don't think so. And I think that if he, even if he is, it's probably as a slot wide receiver well, and they just drafted a uh, tight end last year. They have Dawson Knox. How many three wide receiver sets are they even going to have this year? We know that in 2023, the bills basically split the season with two offensive coordinators. It took until week nine for Khalil Shakir to get a target when he wasn't lining up in the slot. And I think on one hand, I can count how many catches he had after not originating out of the slot. Um, I went back and watched every single one of his targets this morning. I think he's a solid player. I think he's a slot plus player. But going back to your original point of why you think he's being drafted where he is as wide receiver 53, 107 overall, uh, one that is actually after Keon Coleman, who's wide receiver 41, Curtis Samuel as wide receiver 50. But I do believe part of it is he's the only guy left in that yeah. wide receiver room who's who's coming back to the team. But man, so much of it was slow playing early routes with like pacing and then at the top of his break, sprinting, adjusting and creating mm-hmm. space. Uh, he did a really good job, I felt, on those extended plays that Josh Allen does have of staying on a string and finding soft areas. And like you said, little wasted movement to get Mm -hmm. slippery and skinny through tackles. And that led to some unreal broken plays that led to long touchdowns. And really that's the reason why he had more receiving yards. Once Joe Brady took over, despite having, I think it was like 43 fewer targets than what Stefan Diggs did. Once Joe Brady took over, I am going down with the ship. And just simply taking Curtis Samuel over yes. Khalil Shakur every that, single time. That is the answer. I actually have Curtis Samuel ranked ahead of Keon Coleman as well. I, it just it was shocking to me that Curtis Samuel is still twenty seven years old. Like yeah, it, like if Khalil Shakir turns into Curtis Samuel, like that is a hell of a win. Or I can just draft prime Curtis Samuel uh, with familiarity in this offense there. So yeah, uh, if I'm pairing Josh Allen with anybody, it, it's definitely Curtis Samuel for me. Okay, we'll talk more about Clear Shakir again on Thursday with Matt Harmon. And by the way, Wednesday, the five players that our guests cannot stop drafting. This week, it's the man himself, Lord Reeves, Rich Reeves, with his annual appearance on the show. Okay, name number six. This one cuts deep. This one sucks. It's it's Nick Chubb. Uh, last year, when he was on the field, the Browns' offense was all right. It was not like as good as it was previously in like the prime of Nick Chubb's career. And after he got injured, the Browns actually went to number one in neutral pass rate from week eight on. I wonder if Kevin Stefanski like wants to be more modern. I know that the front office offense does. uh, And I'm not sure if they're going to be able to just run the ball as much as they did with Nick Chubb. We already know that Nick Chubb is not going to be out there on passing situations, especially after this knee dislocation. So I think even before we get to like how scary the knee injury is, I think there's just like a different offense that's going to be deployed with the Browns that's going to work against Nick Chubb, even if we got fully healthy Nick Chubb. And then you look at after the injury, what did the Browns do? They kept him for $2 million more than they would have if they would have outright released him. Like that's not that much money out there. Nick Chubb is still not cutting on his knee. It was a basically a knee dislocation, or if not that very close to that to the same knee that he actually had a knee dislocation on. He is certainly older out there. And the Browns, I think, are going to be kind of in the mix throughout the season where I'm not sure if they're going to really be rushing him at any point in the season. So it's not that I like Jerome Ford or Deonta Foreman very much. I just think that they're going to try to pass the ball, and that's what all their investments have been over the last couple uh, seasons. The offensive line isn't as good as the prime. Uh, So even if we get Nick Chubb like looking healthier than expected, which I don't think is going to be the case, I just think that everything about the Browns kind of trending the wrong uh, direction for him. Quote, they could have just cut me dry and left me hanging, right? But they did a great job. I want to be here in Cleveland. They know that. So he came to a great point. Like you said, I mean, it was a salary reduction 
I hate talking about this though, because Nick Chubb is literally one of my favorite players in the oh, league. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what he got hurt in week two or week three last year and mm-hmm. probably would have smashed the season. Like he does every single year might go down as one of the most underrated runners of oh, yeah. all time in this league. Uh, but the negatives just continue to stack up multi-ligament, two separate surgeries, probably a pup candidate. Yeah. Recently said there's no timetable for return. Uh, now, would you assume that the Browns did enough to balance out losing a playmaker, an individual, a priority player like Nick Chubb for the first half of the season with just bring the table, Jerome <laughs> Ford and Deontay yeah. Foreman? Or to you, is that also maybe a signal of, hey, we're not going to rely on this so much like we did with Baker Mayfield? Yeah. And instead, now we're going to what we did with Joe Flacco yeah. at the end, even though it's now Deshaun Watson back at the helm. But it's also Deshaun Watson with post breakout David Njoku. Uh, right. Amari Cooper still looking fantastic. They at least have made attempts with Elijah Moore and Jerry Judy. We'll see if that works out for them. Uh, probably not likely, but. Every action they have had on this offense has been to figure out the pass game, not the, the ground game there. And Jerome Ford, I think, is fine enough. Um, and it's still only June 11th. Like a player like Samaj P. Ryan, could he get released? And then they the Browns sign him? Certainly, yes. Um, so I'm not sure if this depth chart is like fully flushed out at the moment either. Another point, since the second half of seasons matter so much, and that's the time that Nick Chubb is going to play. It's not like this is an expensive backfield. I no, mean, Nick Chubb cheap. is being drafted as running back 39. That's 130 overall. Right. Uh, the rest of this Browns backfield, just to bring it up, is Jerome Ford as running back 41 and Deontay mm-hmm. Foreman as the running back 62. I mean, it, this is probably what a bottom three cost for sure to, at, at the position. And when you consider what the Browns have previously been, that seems super cheap. It is super cheap. The Browns this year projected to be the 19th scoring team this year. So like it is relatively cheap. Uh, I think the problem is like this is going to be a rotation. Uh, and I still think there can be somebody else back there. And then also every backfield seems cheap to me. Like the running back prices on <laughs> underdog right now are crazy. I only get five of them on yeah. my build. I want to be very particular on which five running backs they are. And there's just too many discounts in rounds, let's say round four to round seven, eight, where I kind of want to be double tapping or having three running backs in that range where I'm not really kind of scooping up value in like the 120s, 130s. He should, to me, he should be priced like Tyler Algier, like late season, he needs an injury, then he's all of a sudden in there. I right. think like that's more appropriate than where he's going. You can get someone like Ty J Spears who's like in a committee but has a chance to like get off and going immediately. Um, so I feel like I would go for those guys instead. Yeah, a couple more names. Again, just Jerome Ford is going after outright Nick Chubb right now. And I know that Jerome Ford is super high variance. He's super big plays, but they have trusted him in the past and he's going as running back 41. If if I'm going to pivot away from Nick Chubb in that area, I'm just going straight to Zach Charbonnet. And uh, yep. I know I keep bringing up his name, but it's just, and it's a horrible outcome. But like, if at some point, Zach Charbonnet due to injury just assumes this backfield it, that would happen if there's an injury to Kenneth Walker, yep. then you're just having a massive season. You're yep. having a massive season. Blake Quorum too. Seventh name. This will be very quick. Dalton Schultz. Uh, you don't throw the ball to Dalton Schultz when you have Nico Collins, Tank Dell, and Steph Diggs. Like, is anyone really arguing against me here? Like, I don't know. Why is he being drafted here? I'm sure it's because teams drafted CJ Stroud and then they were looking to double stack him with Dalton Schultz. But yeah, last- those three wide receivers go super early. Yeah, so you probably drafted one of them. Then you drafted Stroud. You're like, I want to double stack him because Stroud's an in-pocket quarterback, and I need to make sure I have two pass to correlation here. Well, I just don't think that Dalton Schultz is going to get the ball enough. Like, why would you throw the ball to him? And last year, when he was, let's say, the number two or number three target in the offense, depending on if Tank Dell was down or, or whoever, he finished 108th overall in fantasy and fantasy points over replacement per game. Like, that was a peak Stroud, and that was without as nearly as much target competition I think the the Texans will use way more three wide receiver sets this year. That's why they bring on Steph, Steph Diggs. They were 21st in three wide receiver set rate last year. That could mean that Dalton Schultz isn't getting as many snaps uh, entirely there. And in general, if you kind of look at this part of the range for drafting tight ends, it's historically awful. Like if you're drafting like the tight end nine to tight end 14, like that is like a 
kind of the dead zone of tight ends where you're like projecting volume, but they're either not good enough or the team's not good enough. In this case, I don't think that Dalton Schultz is good enough to compete with the three alpha wide receivers that they have there. So Cole Komet, same argument here as Dalton Schultz, like this tier of tight ends, like not for me, like get draft Jake Ferguson or you're waiting for Noah Fant. Anything in between this is not very good. He's being drafted as a tight end 13 right now, 124 overall. And like you said, without Steph Diggs, and then with half the season without Tank Dell and some games miss for Nico Collins, he still finishes just the tied in 11 in points per game last season. And that is 8.1 fancy points per contest, which is super replaceable. Super you should be able to Dr. Frank and sign the position Hell yeah. and get th three tight ends to get you 8.1. Mm -hmm. You just need a tight end to score a touchdown on your team Any of each week for, for you to do that. Yeah. Now, with that said, he did have five top five finishes this right. past season and then a whole bunch of like bottoming out weeks. And I think the mm -hmm. bottoming out weeks are notable to point out because again, on an offense last year that mostly ran two wide receiver sets, we saw Bobby Slowick build everything around multiple tight end and fullback sets. And he's going to continue to do that. They just drafted Cade Stover. Last year, we saw guys like Andrew Beck and Eric Saubert getting playing time. And so while Dalton Schultz, by the way, has guaranteed money, so he's going to be on the roster this year and next year, I just don't think he has as much of an input in the mm -hmm. series in series out progression yep. of the passing game like he did this past season and if you do need to pivot in that area the guy going one spot after him at the tight end position is pat frymuth i'm just going in that direction it's not even close yeah i mean he's i think frymuth better than schultz like in real life and then also the target competition is like so dissimilar three more names let's throw a quarterback at the people yeah kirk cousins um Statue quarterbacks in a game called best ball where you need upside, not necessarily for me. You also only get two or three quarterbacks on your best ball teams. Like I want to be very picky with this. And I think there's like just playing time risk in multiple ways. Early in the season, you have setback risk. He's coming off, off the torn Achilles. And then late season, if the Falcons are not competitive or if Kirk Cousins isn't very good, they obviously want Michael Penix to be involved at some point. So Kirk Cousins can play the first 14 weeks, and then when you finally get to the fantasy playoffs, then all of a sudden Penix is in there. So I think that Kirk Cousins becomes the first quarterback uh, in underdog ADP that has like very legit bench risking uh, or bench risk. And... On top of that, to me, if you go watch Kirk Cousins, and this might be like try to, trying to zoom in and be a doctor uh, too much, Kirk Cousins throws with his base. Like, you're not seeing a bunch of sidearm stuff. You're not seeing a bunch of scramble stuff. Like mechanics. Yeah, Love this. like just sitting there on his back foot and trying to throw the ball. Kirk Cousins needs all of that because he's not some super athlete out there. He needs the perfect mechanics for that. Is he going to respond to that perfectly? I'm not sure. Like, to me, Aaron Rodgers, who can just whip the ball with his core and his shoulders, you've seen from different arm angles and stuff, to me has a better chance of, like, playing through this than Kirk Cousins, who is always just on time operating like this and throwing with a perfect base. If there was something where, like, Kirk Cousins lose 10% of his fastball, I don't know, man. That seems more like a triple-A pitcher and not an MLB guy. I am stunned how much of practice stuff he's actually completing at this moment. When they drafted Michael Penix, I went on this mini rant of, hey, coming off an Achilles and we get training camp and preseason games. And with this massive injury, is Michael Penix just going to be the first team quarterback through all that stuff and then just immediately get benched when week one happens? Yeah. Again, I am stunned with how much Kirk Cousins is actually getting reps mm -hmm. in OTAs and offseason work. He's legitimately throwing. And that's that's awesome. Just simply put, I, I'm avoiding this area of really quarterbacks. Same. Um, I mean, Justin Herbert's going one spot above him after it. Like you said, it's Stafford, Aaron Rodgers. I mean, again, avoiding this area and maybe it's the death of me, but like Geno Smith is quarterback 23 is where yes. I keep going right after this tier. And but right before this tier, you get your Kyler Murray's, your Jaden Daniels, your Caleb. Jared Goff. Yeah, Jared, like Jared Goff is like a, the less risky version Tua. of Kirk Cousins. Same thing Kirk with Trevor? Tua. Like, yeah, I mean, those guys are projected for more points this year than the Falcons are. Uh, who are like right in the middle of the pack. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up, you're sitting here doing these drafts, round 17, round 18. You're looking at the board. It's a bunch of guys that you don't want to draft that running back and wide receiver because for playing time reasons. And then all, all of a sudden you like look up and you're like, oh, Bryce Young's available. Bo Nix is available. Drake May is available. Will, I'll, Levis. I'll, Will Levis. I'll throw out two more. Daniel Jones. We've seen him be a top 12 quarterback. He's got Malik Neighbors all of a sudden. I'm interested there. The reports from Drew Locke. Have you seen them? They're not very positive. 
right now out of out of camp. And then Russell Wilson to me, like I think that he can throw some deep passes down the field yeah. still. Justin Fields, if you're into that, I think like to me, like the very late round quarterback options seem pretty intriguing to me. Right. And I don't want to get stuck in statue quarterback land, especially when I can just draft Justin Herbert or Trevor Lawrence right next to him. This is not my show. And I understand like what Pandora's fantasy box could be if Justin Fields does start. But if you listen to any, any Steelers beat writer at this moment, Jerry Dulac just had a great interview with Rich Eisen a couple weeks ago. And by the way, Steelers beat writers are quite connected to the understanding of who's on the depth chart and the belief of certain players on there. There is like no chance yeah. that Justin Fields is getting on the field yeah. unless Russell Wilson totally bottoms out or gets injured. And that has to happen for an extended period of time right. for this to happen with Justin Fields. So like while Fields has been a top 10 score for us constantly, again, this is not my show, but I would mention that him simply being drafted ahead of Russell Wilson at this right. point is a, uh, Kind of nuts. So. I'm afraid to admit it, but I am drafting some Russell Wilson now. Like the reports are just so positive versus Fields right now. There's even other Steelers reporters that are mentioning the same thing. So it's like to me, I'll I'll do Pickens, Fire Muth, Russell Wilson, my last pick, and see what happens. I uh, mean, the way that they talk about it, again, something seismic has to happen for Justin Fields to even see the field versus yeah. what Russell Wilson. Right, it was a what a fifth round pick. Nobody wanted him. Okay, two more names. Give us a tight end. Tight end Ben Sennett. Uh, hopefully, like for you guys in redraft, like this podcast is like for the deep galaxy brand people. Like your redraft league is not drafting Ben Sennett, but on underdog, people are fired up around him. As a reminder, he goes in the second round to the Washington Commanders. Are the Washington Commanders the, the team that we should be looking for for like nailing their draft picks? I don't think so. Uh, if you look at NFL draft consensus rankings that happened, like you have to turn these thing in before the draft. This is I won this in 2020, so I like to look at these consensus rankings. He was the 87th overall player. He was a tight end three because the commanders reach on him versus consensus. Well, I mean, the, the I consensus, don't know if that's fair. No, commanders drafting a guy way ahead of uh, projections. Well, in okay, was a tight end two, Jatavian Sanders? Uh, it might have been, but the main yeah, point was I mean, I, I, I would have ranked Benson it ahead because we're talking about you know an athletic guy, which is okay. important when you hit. Yes you know, the top end. I don't like Sanders either. Position. This is not a Sanders like, show. This is not, I, I will not. But the point you just made was about Jatavian Sanders. He was seventh overall. Screw tight end three. He was the 87th overall player in the commanders draft him way ahead of that. And now I'm supposed to pretend like Ben Sennett was like some second round draft pick. Like when Laporto fell to the second round, Daniel Jeremiah and a lot of other people thought he was a first round pick. And the Lions are actually good at drafting on like the commanders. Anyways, the commanders projected for 26 most points in 2024 we need touchdowns at this position this is not a position yep. that accumulates receptions and yards very often he also was this kind of like full black tight end kind of hybrid uh he won he wore number 34 on his jersey for example uh and i think there might be a little bit of a learning curve like him going into play like legit tight end they have zach Ertz who loves to keep uh breakout tight ends on the curb for one year that they shouldn't be uh we just saw that with trey mcbride um, a little bit ago. So I'm not sure why people are like fired up to draft him. I think it goes back to you have Jaden Daniels. A lot of people don't like Johan Dotson. There's not many. You're already drafting Luke McCaffrey. I don't want to draft Luke McCaffrey. No. They have like, they run out of options to me. It's just way too early for like a potential, like fullback on the commanders. To me, the reason people are drafting is because they missed out on Sam Laporta last year. And yeah. they believe, a, you know, a second round pick who's super athletic of position right. and where opportunity uh, is not given or, blocked in front of him right now that's you know the the track they have in their mind i think it's quite different than what we saw with sam laporta who immediately was going to be a starting tight end everyone said it on that team same thing goes for like luke musgrave even that that didn't hit we know he was working with the starters immediately uh you are going against your point when saying that zach Ertz blocking uh ben Sinet because he's going to be making less than the best ball mania five winner. Uh, he's at, I think about $2.4 million for his yeah. contract this year. Also 34 years old, but like, again, let's not just forget of Zach Ertz and Cliff Kingsbury and the combination that they have, you know, plenty of games of 10 plus targets when they were together in Arizona. But again, I love young athletic tight ends. Uh, I'm just not really in on Benson at the current ADP. If it was like tight end 29 versus sure. tight end 19, again, I just think 
yeah. people are paying for the breakouts of Sam Laporta last year and having to overpay right now for Ben Sinema. If you want to draft him, wait until August 31st when he's the number two in training camp and his 80 training camp will could definitely shift a whole bunch of, of yeah. stuff for especially this rookie tight end. Yeah, definitely. Okay, one more name. Who is it? Uh, Troy Franklin uh, goes in the fourth round of the NFL draft. He's on a team that is projected for the 30th most points this season. Only the Patriots and the Panthers project for fewer points than the Broncos. And so, like, first of all, like, not many opportunities for fantasy points based on the offense. And then, like, you, you might laugh, but there are names in this wide receiver depth chart. Maybe not great names, but there are there are names. Cortland Sutton, certified good at football. Josh Reynolds, who loves to keep deep targets, too small, inconsistent players like Jamison Williams on the bench. Josh Reynolds, he gets $4 million guaranteed uh, this year. Tim Patrick, he's back from injury, a second injury. He's due $7 million guaranteed. He will be out there. Marvin Mims was Sean Payton's guy. This kind of same mold, underside, deep ball player, uh, pretty inconsistent on the rest of his game, but he was a second rounder uh, just last year. Like to me, this is going to be a rotation at best. And Troy Franklin, to me, the reason why he was projected second round pick that falls all the way down there is there was obviously some size issues, but also the just his hands were inconsistent. He didn't run like the most diverse route tree when you have in breaking routes working over the middle. I thought that his size would really work against him. Yeah. I think in development player, just how Marvin Mims is at the same time. And that's why Marvin Mims didn't play very much last year. And we're drafting him ahead of guys who I feel pretty confident are going to be in two wide receiver sets, three wide receiver sets. I think that Troy Franklin is like one of the first guys that could play seven snaps per game. Uh, this year and to me the, he should be like around 18 guy not going around 15 right now Troy Franklin wide receiver 75 167 overall one spot ahead of his compatriot in Marvin Mims Jr. I think you can blame producer Weaves and the dynasty fantasy football community yes. for this Troy Franklin stuff because pre-draft their opinion was very much this way and then wide receiver or excuse me round four draft capital and I don't know if it's fully shifted back. As you said, it's always more difficult for a player's ADP to fall than it is to rise. I mean, my big issue with Troy Franklin, and you outlined it, was when players were working through him to contest a target, uh, he just did not have the play strength for that. And then you go back and chart it, he got three of 26 tight window targets this past season. If you're looking for a pivot in this area, I will take Michael Wilson ahead of him because I think he's going to be a two wide receiver starter for the Arizona Cardinals. And if you're looking a bit later, we're finally getting it to Marcus Robinson, wide receiver oh, 81, yeah. 184 overall. And that's yep. up about 12 spots since last month. Yep. I'll, I'd rather have like Darius Slayton, who's going to be out there a bunch too. There's there's a lot of names down there, but this goes back to like the quarterbacks available in this kind of range. I like the quarterbacks. Uh, the Noah fans, like those type of guys, CH, Elijah Mitchell, there's like some handcuff guys. So it's just like not a position I want to be drafting this late very often. Like just before I'm like, just go draft Jalen Polk, like Jermaine Burton, like guys that are actually going to be out on the field. Troy Franklin, like just like the draft story arc reminds me of a guy that you know very well. Hakeem Butler, first, second oh. round pick, falls to round four. Oh. And now Count ball, out. Hey, no. is falling out and might oh. make back in the league. But like we've seen this supposed to go round two goes round four story it doesn't end well most often we talked about this territory i would just rather take the pocket quarterbacks over this type of wide receiver profile like i would rather take kirk cousins just wait no. for josh reynolds so it's, it's not one or the other yeah, <laughs> it'll be josh reynolds i promise you guys uh i mean even rashad bateman is going like yes. in this area hunter henry uh, anyways we're gonna have shows where we outline our favorite pick in every single round our sleepers and that's certainly in this territory so don't want to deliver too many names but hopefully you enjoy this episode as you can tell all of this stems from drafts going on underdog fantasy at this moment we have best ball mania five which is a 25 dollar entry we also have three and five dollar tournaments that new me and hope are posting all the time all the time so click the link in the description down below if you're in one of these yellow states that producer weeds put the map on the screen and you've heard us talk about best ball before and never played now is the time to do so all right tomorrow rich rebar on the show thursday matt Harmon on the show so hit that subscribe button leave a thumbs up let us know in the comments how dumb hayden was for questioning second year wide receivers 
at the top of this list. And we'll check you all in the next video. See ya.